Hi, this is Charlene Campbell. This is part two of the explanation of handouts for introduction to midwifery skills level one. And I was just talking about the um, practice guidelines and we were going into one of the details, um, one of them in detail about candidiasis or vaginal yeast infection. Okay. And so then the management and education, that's where we were. So um, that goes on, you know, um, eliminating simple sugars, um, douching with water and vinegar, yogurt and water, or acidophilus and water, um, low douche, not high, um, and then also some vagicil, vitamin E, a few other things, um, and then treating the sexual partner too so that they're not reinfecting one another. That's extremely important in any kind of any kind of vaginal issues with the mother, whether it's bacteria, vaginosis, candidiasis, or anything, it's very important for the partner to be treated as well and for that to be cared for. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's it. That's basically, it's, it's quite a bit different, but it's basically what you would do. Now I'm just going to give you, just to give you an idea how different they can be. Um, here now I think it's interesting how she's got like for constipation she's got um, Webster technique with trained chiropractor which I think the Webster technique is amazing for helping with a lot of things with malpositioning and also with um, constipation I think that so she's got a lot of um, really cool recommendations you know you can you can look at that okay now um let's see what else do we want to talk about um i've got the apgar scoring i've got the apgar scoring handout there's a little test you can actually test yourself here on it um i think just really watching some births online good home births and seeing how um, it takes the baby time to transition and seeing if you can guess what the APGAR is. Usually the most significant symptoms of the APGAR are the tone of the arms and the respiratory effort. Um, so the tone of the whole body really, if it's toned, not so much the color, like we used to think it was the color, not so much the color, the respiratory efforts and the tone of the baby, okay? And um, the heart rate, of course, is very important too. But if the respiratory effort is the most important thing because the heart rate will fall in line as soon as the baby starts getting good respiratory rates, uh, inhalations. That's why it's important to understand how vital it is to know how to do infant resuscitation. Okay, now um, let's see. Let's do what else have we got here? Um, I think that these are self-explanatory. Um, the notice of privacy practices is pretty standard that you need to do, you know, understand that. And um, there's also the silence is golden, so you can help you understand um, how important it is to keep confidences and what that means and to keep people's information private also. Always asking permission, always getting a signature for any kind of shared, sharing of information. Um, and I think I'm just going to go right into the last one that I want to talk about. Actually, no, I've got two more here. I've got this one. This is your book that I got permission from the writer, Elizabeth Davies, to include this um chapter which is very it's almost like a book it is an excellently done chapter basic understanding of how to deliver a baby so really study this it's called assisting at births and it's excellent like just some of the pictures i i actually know the artist linda harrison who drew these and they're kind of amazing photographs there's a placenta some of these photographs are just really beautifully done you know um so yeah, go in there and give a good read to that one. That's basic, okay? And then I'm going to go over this last one, which is emergency childbirth.
and it's a handout that we give the parents, but I thought it would be really helpful. Here it is. Uh, really helpful for you to just go over this with you today in here. So this is the basic steps of emergency childbirth. I kind of want to just go over this with you. Okay, so that you kind of have this in your heart and in your mind, and you can watch this a few times. I'm going to read, and then I'm just going to interject if I feel impressed too, okay? This will just give you a basic understanding of how to respond and help be calm in emergency childbirth, okay? Number one, stay calm. This is the most important point to remember. Birth is designed to work beautifully in a variety of circumstances. If it weren't, the human race would have died out long ago. But the system depends on a complex interaction of hormones. We call it the hormone cocktail. It's a very important principle to understand. When the mother is stressed or frightened, these hormones can become disrupted and cause problems with the birth or with the postpartum period. Women in labor are very suggestible. And I've talked about this before. It's, they are highly suggestible. So we can use that for our benefit, for their benefit. But we also have to be mindful not to use that in any way that inhibits or blocks or prevents their progress or they're feeling completely fully autonomous, safe, and sovereign in their own ability to respond to their birth without anybody else's projections in there. Okay, um, especially fear, because <laughs> fear is a tangible thing. So you, you, know, you don't bring fear into a birthing space. You release that, you alchemize it yourself. You, and even if it's coming up for you, you, you learn how to alchemize fear into loving compassion for all of humanity, for yourself and all others and the good of all. Okay, um, women in labor are very suggestible and will absorb the emotions of the people around them. If you panic, she will panic. If you speak calmly and quietly, it will help her be calm. So take a deep breath, say a prayer, do your best, and leave it in God's hands. Number two, slow down we kind of get going, especially when anxiety creeps in. If you've had PTSD or whatever, you could easily go into a stress reaction at a birth because it can be kind of uncertain. There's a lot of unpredictability at birth. So you can't be, you can't have a, your own agenda or think things have to match a certain agenda. You have to trust, you have to be peaceful and you have to have a, a spiritual awareness. I think it's really helpful so that you can feel that things are in the hands of God in a really healthy way, you're still going to respond very responsibly, very intelligently, and very intuitively. But you also have this innate faith in the mother's capacity to birth and in the natural um, support of the deity and divine angelic ministers around you. I teach that in my class, the Errand of Angels, where I teach a four-hour birth response class to people that are lay people that don't have birth experience. And it reduces fear. It reduces fear every time. So really knowledge is power when it comes to birth. When you really truly understand things, you don't go into fear. Rarely. Um, and actually you can train yourself so you never do. That's a choice. It takes time, it takes patience, and it takes practice. But everyone can do that. Okay, so this is part of being calm, but is also necessary to have patience. With a first-time mother, the birth can be quite slow at the end. The bit, yeah, really slow. It can be like, come out and then go back, come out, go back. And you just, you just wait. You don't try to get her to push harder. You don't try to, you know, you just have complete patience, especially with the first time mama, this can be really slow. While the tissues have to stretch naturally. Um, if you panic, um, she will panic. Oh, sorry. I jumped back. Um, but yeah, it's true. If you get upset, that's a contagious thing, right? So even if you got a smile on your face, if you're so learn to learn to to relax your body, learn to calm your mind, learn to detach and not be so attached to anything. Just having faith that things work out the way they're meant to, and you just do your best, and you show up, and God shows up with you, and you don't worry about the outcome. You trust that it'll work out the way it's meant to divine right order in all things. Okay. Um, 
So it's normal and desirable for the baby's head to come out and then disappear. When she rests in between contractions, the baby is slowly stretching the mother's tissues. You must adopt this patient, timeless pace. Patient, timeless pace. I like that. This is written by Rochelle Jolly, another midwife who does VBACs, breaches, and twins. These are really amazing people, intuitive, and they have good outcomes too. They're amazing women. I very much admire them. Um, so hurrying and scurrying will only upset the mother. So speak encouragingly to the mother. Women are very sug suggestible, as we mentioned. If you tell her she can do it, she will do it. She will believe you and she'll do it. Tell her she's doing great. Tell her she's making good progress. Tell her it won't be long, if that's true. I mean, sometimes you don't want to say that too early. It won't be long till she holds her baby, but it's true that she will be holding her baby soon, right? <laughs> I think that you can encourage her. Anything that you can do to encourage the mom, I think that's a really human, humane thing to do, a loving, compassionate thing to do. Um, give the mother water to drink if she wants it. Dehydration makes the whole process harder. Near the end of the labor, the mother probably won't want more than sips of water, but they should be frequently given. If she is in earlier stages of labor, she will need to eat easily digestible foods and or drinks with calories in order to keep up her energy. And that's important. Is to It's kind of like a running a marathon. You don't want to not have your pit stops, man. Get ready. You have some pit, you have some good pit stops. Easy things that you can pop in your mouth, you know. Or the mother, you know, whoever you're helping. Um, and, and number five is encourage the mother to adopt an efficient position, usually of her own choice. And I'm not going to go into that. You can read about that. But I think, yeah, position is extremely important. If she starts to panic, she's going to experience more pain. So anything you can do to help her feel autonomous and like sometimes rocking back and forth can be good. Um, any kind of positions where I think forward leaning, I'm just going to show you, Let's see if I can get this. I think forward leaning positions, um, are good, you know, having legs wide open, sometimes leaning over a ball like this, you know, can be good. And then rocking, you know, any kind of rocking or hips going back and forth, you know, can be really good. And then also sometimes just having a pillow or something, you know, lower. And especially if you're trying to work with the uh, position of the baby, this can be a really, really good position for, um, Helping realign the baby if it's not quite in a good position. So yeah, and I will um, also mention another book that I have that um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna grab it here. It's in the other manual that I created. Highly recommend it. Um, just maybe point out a couple things. Here. It's very good. But this is um, comes from my classes that I just mentioned, and I have a video, and I have a class that I'm putting together um, the online that includes this information as well. So, but this just basically goes through and gives you some really good like pictures of positions. Valerie Hall, another midwife, and I made this. And um, different positions that you can do with the mom to support her, um, depending on, like this is one where you're doing a, um, a running start position and you've got the leg up really high. That could be in case of a um, malpositioned baby or even a shoulder dystocia. This is the one I just showed you, which is the knee chest and there's a pillow. Then this is the cat cow. That one is also very good. Um, this is the McRoberts where you have to push the legs right back up in case of a shoulder dystocia. And you can do that on the front too. This is an example of an inverted McRoberts where instead of doing it on the mother's back, which actually pushes on the spine and causes there to be less room in the pelvic 
opening. So this is a really good alternative to the McRoberts. And then, of course, the supported standing or low squat can be really, really helpful to get the baby out. But this is just another little um, book on some basics to um, help you know how to help a woman in a low resource setting. Um, this also shows the rebozo. I don't know if any of you have um, ever used a rebozo, but it's a cloth and you wrap it around the mother's buttocks or if she's on her hands and knees around her belly and you kind of jiggle it. And um, it can really help put the baby back in a good position. So I'm just going to continue with a few more of these steps on this handout. This handout is called Basic Steps of Emergency Childbirth. Okay. <clears throat> Let's take a little turn here. Hope you're enjoying it. Um, number six is putting something clean under the mother. So really having something. Um, this is not only for protecting the floor or bed, but also to keep the area clean as to minimize the chance of infection. If you can find something white or light colored, it will be easier to assess the amount of blood loss. Number seven, wash your hands. Number eight, keep your hands out of the birth canal. Unless you have experience and you're clean and sanitary, there's no that's a high risk area and there really is no reason to go inside the mother's vagina to find out what how she is uh, I mean how dilated she is you can tell by her outward signs um, if her contractions are um, lasting longer than a minute and they're four minutes apart for about one to two hours and they've been steadily like that then she's in active labor and um, that's basically it. She, you know and when she's in active labor then she needs help and before that it's good if she doesn't focus too much on the labor but focuses on preparing and just resting and doing the daily normal things that she would do that aren't too strenuous but still keep her not too highly focused on it too early um yeah the, another way you can tell how dilated, I mean, this can be a really good way to tell too. If you, if the woman's naked and you can see her back, there's a line that will go up her, her buttocks and it will tell you how dilated she is. And you can go into, um, I don't know exactly where that information is, but I think it's in my book. I think it's in one of my manuals and it has a little diagram um, that you can look it up online too. Okay. So there's different ways to tell how dilated they are, but we're not going to go in and check in the dilation. Not in a low resource setting. If you're a midwife and that's all set and you, you know you're going to do it, then that. But this is for emergency childbirth, this one, this handout. And we give this to the parents. Like Rochelle bought this for her parents and the re or created this. Why? Because birth is un unpredictable. Precipitous birth does happen. That means that it, it comes before you have a chance to anticipate it and you know, she's having the baby before you're there. So that's why we try to prepare people. Um, so when the baby is born, make sure he or she can breathe. If there's a lot of secretions on the face, wipe the baby's face. If the cord's around the neck, slip it off or unwind it. And you know, you can tell right when you're delivering the baby. I just want to show you this real quick. But right when you're delivering the baby, I don't have my placenta in here because I'm sewing new ones. <laughs> I'm making new placentas for my classes. But just if you can imagine, the baby's being birthed, right? And the cords are on the neck. As the baby's head's coming out, you can kind of see. So when you see that there's cord there, you don't let the baby just come out like this from the mama. You keep the baby's head close to the mother's opening and you somersault the baby out like that. Okay, and just hold the baby there. And, and easily you can unwind however many wraps one, two, three, four, five wraps, whatever it is. Get those wraps off. <laughs> it works every time. It does. Okay. Uh, you never need to cut on the neck. That's an old practice and it's not good because you need to keep the cord blood flowing for the baby to get the nutrients it needs, that he or she needs. Okay, so um, if the cord is around the neck, slip it off or unwind it. Hold the baby securely with the face lower than the bottom so fluids can drain. So pause for 
we teach postural drainage in our classes where you're kind of holding, you're kind of supporting on each side of the baby's head and you're kind of going like this in a downward position for the baby to drain the mucus secretions out. Very effective. More effective than sectioning really is, is postural drainage. And sucking can cause a vagal response in the baby. So we really discourage um, syringes or any kind of suctioning of the mouth unless it's extremely indicated. And I use a electric suction machine with a catheter that goes in, or you can use a dilly. Those are the two things I re recommend. Other, besides, I don't recommend the syringe, bulb syringe, because of the vagal response. And because it's not as effective, if you really have mucus, you want something that's going to work. So that's a dilly. And a dilly you put, I'm just going to show you what a dilly is, okay? Because um, that's kind of an important thing. And you can buy them very cheap. You know, you can buy a dilly. Very cheap. Okay, here's a dilly. Let's look at it. <clears throat> so here's the dilly. So you've got two tubes going into a little. This is what's going to contain your mucus. That's what's going to contain the mucus. This is going to go in your mouth, this little part. And this is going to go into the baby. So you're going to put this in your mouth. And you're going to suck on it. And you always do the mouth first, and then each of the nares, each of the nares. So you're going to go in not too far, just, you know, all around there. You suck, suck, suck. And then when you look down, you're going to see stuff in your mucus trap. Okay. Um, so... But you can also, if you don't have one of those, we teach the mothers to do it themselves where they can put their mouth right over the baby's mouth and nose. I don't have the baby here anymore, but right over the baby's mouth and nose and suck and then spit. The dad could do it too. Um, if you really had it, but mostly the postural drainage will get rid of that. Okay, let's move on with this handout now. So you are going to... Um, Hold the baby securely with the face lower than the bottom so fluids can drain out. If baby has not cried after a few seconds, stimulate by rubbing the back from the base of the spine to the neck. Talk to the baby and encourage the mother and father to talk to their baby. Put the baby skin to skin on the mother's chest or tummy. This is the best place for the baby to regulate temperature, breathing, and heart rate. That's the kangaroo care we talked about. Very important. Uh, it's an absolute scientifically proven fact that kangaroo, chair, kangaroo care um, improves the baby's um, respiration rate, um, growth rate, temperature, and breathing, and heart rate. Yeah, and heart rate. So everything, every single vital sign is improved um, with skin to skin. So we keep babies skin to skin. Um, then keep the baby warm. You can dry the baby off, then change that towel, put a fresh towel. Really important not to have any wet linen around a baby. Um, they, they have very little ability to retain heat. Babies do. So moisture is a problem. So getting the baby dry, getting the mother dry, and skin to skin with a blanket over top of the baby so the baby stays warm. Kind of like a mother's like a little incubator for baby on her chest. And at the mother's breast, it has been proven that they will literally heat up in order to um, accommodate the, um, the baby. Like if the baby's cold, the mother's breast will literally heat up. I mean, it's a miracle. It really is. Okay. Um, help the mother into a comfortable position and keep her warm. Give her something to drink that has calories some food too I think is good like toast with peanut butter and honey on it or something I think it's good for a mom to have something to eat eggs I usually used to make like a full course breakfast for them at my birth center <laughs> I mean you know bacon and uh, not necessarily bacon but but eggs and toast and maybe some some fruit or something yeah it's nice 
gets them back on track better. I think moms do better if they eat right after um, they have their baby. Or pretty soon, like within the next couple of hours, you know. And then keep the energy in the room low in order for mother's hormones to act properly and her, help her expel the placenta and minimize bleeding. She must keep calm, comfortable, and encouraged to bond with her baby. Don't say anything out like that's worrisome and allow people in the room don't allow people in the room to become noisy sometimes people can just start going into party atmosphere keep the energy down the transition into new life needs to be very mellow and very sweet and very paced in slow pace for the baby and the mom to bond properly and that's essential for breastfeeding and for good quality relationships and intact ability to trust and to reduce stress for the baby and the mother okay um, don't cut the cord until the placenta is out i don't think you should even cut the cord in a low research setting unless you have extremely sterile tools and it's after like an hour or two or whatever after the placenta has already come out um, it often takes uh, from 20 minutes to an hour for the placenta to be expelled it will be at least several minutes before the mother feels crampy that's a signal that the uterus is contracting and to try to push the placenta out only with contractions. Um, sometimes if, it, if the placenta doesn't come, you can use nipple stimulation, that can help. Um, the baby though is really doing that. All the baby's things are doing that, skin to skin. Um, there will usually be a small gush of blood, which is a signal that the placenta has detached from inside the uterus. And that'll usually just be only maybe a quarter to a half a cup of blood that comes out. And you'll see it though, like a red gush. And you'll go, oh, ah, that's the detached placenta. So the next contraction, she can try to push it out. And if she can't, she can get up and you can help her up and they, she can squat. Sometimes the squat is all you need and that will just, gravity does it. Um, and, and she pushes a little bit too with her contraction. Um, she'll probably start to feel a bit restless and then the placenta is probably just sitting inside the vagina and will come out easily if she kneels up or stands up. Wrap the placenta in something and put it near the baby. If you have sterile scissors or something sterile to tie off the cord securely, you may tie the cord tightly and cut the baby free of the placenta. And I don't recommend to do that. I really don't. I think it's not a good thing to do. Otherwise, and this is my suggestion, just keep it wrapped uh, keep the placenta wrapped near the baby for a few days until the cord dries and falls off. This was an old pioneer method and is still better than clamping or cutting with unclean instruments. I highly agree. Encourage laid back breastfeeding. I'm adding that because I'm sure she, she has that here. But laid back breastfeeding, that means they're not sitting up trying to breastfeed the bottle feeding way. They're laying back with the baby on top that's the way to having no latch problems and full-on 100% breastfeeding rates it's absolutely essential in a low resource setting um, is to breastfeed the baby because formula might not be available um, often isn't in a low resource environment so help the mother place the baby's mouth near her breast eventually most babies will latch on by themselves or the baby may need a little bit of help Give the baby time. At first, she will just mouth around and lick at the nipple. Even this is helpful in causing the mother to release the hormones that make the uterus contract and prevent excessive bleeding. Very important. All the licking, the patting, the sucking, anything that baby's doing is extremely important for that hormone cocktail to stay elevated and, and working and high so that the mother's body does exactly what it's supposed to do. So the atmosphere, all those things take into consideration. If help is not available or cannot arrive, stay with the mother for the first several hours. She may need help to get up to and urinate. Don't let her go anywhere by herself for the first 24 hours because she may faint suddenly. Her bleeding should decrease after the placenta is out and she should not fill a large cotex in less than 30 minutes. If mother, is, if mother will stay in bed, I highly recommend she does, and you can even do a hand wash on her. She doesn't have to get up and go to the to the bathroom. She could pee on a pad or in a in a bedpan if she didn't feel up to it. And she could also um, have a you could wash her with a bowl of warm, you know, soapy water and clean her off. You don't if she didn't feel up to having a shower or there was some concern she might faint or whatever. 
Um, and then that baby should have skin to skin with the father while she's in the shower, if that's what's happening. That shouldn't be interrupted for any reason. And then um, if the mother will stay in bed and keep her baby skin to skin and dress the baby only in a diaper if the room is warm enough, but you keep the blankets on the outside, breastfeeding will likely go well and the mother will recover well. She needs a good hearty meal soon after the birth. Ugh, I agree. Um, then she and the baby need to sleep. I, I tell parents to plan their meal. Like, what are you going to eat after? And so they, they plan it and they've got that meal ready after and then I can feed it to them. But if they come to the birth center, I usually would just make them something, you know. Take a deep breath, get something to eat and rest yourself. You deserve it. That's the end yes it is it can be long it can be grueling it can be kind of draining emotionally so you really have to do good self-care and be a good example of of um i call it vigilant self-care <laughs> and and i think it's it's important for us to learn that as care providers so i think most of the other handouts are really self-explanatory i hope you enjoyed a few of the little tidbits i shared with you today God bless you and have a great rest of your course. All right, take care. Bye-bye.